Okay, so today's video is going to cover uh, reproduction, focusing a lot on sexual reproduction and meiosis. So first though, before we get into that too much, let's talk a little bit about asexual reproduction. Let's talk first about some of the advantages of this. So asexual reproduction has a handful of advantages. First of all, you don't have to find a mate. Okay, there's only one organism involved, so you don't have to go hunting for a mate. Okay, uh, second of all, it's significantly faster. Okay, so organisms that do asexual reproduction reproduce faster than other organisms. They also usually can reproduce a larger number of organisms with fewer resources and energy. So it's happening much faster. They're um, making more and more organisms than sexual reproduction, and it requires less energy. Think about the burden of sexual reproduction, particularly on the mother, as they're trying to grow and develop that growing offspring. That requires significant amount of energy and resources um, that takes away from the mother. Okay? Um, in a stable environment, your asexual reproduction is optimum. Okay? That's ideal, but very rarely is the environment actually going to be stable. And this will use either some form of binary fission or if it's a eukaryotic cell, it will use mitosis. So let's look at a couple of examples. So the first example that we have here is budding. And during budding, the offspring goes, grows out of the body of the parent. So it's growing straight out of the body of the parent. Um, examples of organisms that do this would be things like a hydra. Okay, so you can see it growing out of the body of the plant. It's growing, growing, basically till it's mature enough to essentially um, break off into its own organism. Another example that we have here on this page is what are called uh, gymules. An uh, example of an organism that does this would be a sponge. Okay, and so what happens here is the parents are going to release basically a hunk of cells. You see this here. Okay, so they release these hunk of cells that are specialized enough that they are able to develop into an offspring. So they release this um, large clump of specialized cells that will then develop into the offspring. And that's what the gemule is, is, that's an E, is the large clump of the cells that they've been released. Okay, and the last three examples we have are uh, fragmentation. So that's this top one here. So in fragmentation, Basically, pieces of the organism, uh, pieces of the or of the parent organism, it's going to break into pieces, and each one of those can develop into a um, into a, an offspring. So you can see that happening. That's actually happening down here. Okay, you can see it breaking into pieces, and each one of those pieces is going to develop into an offspring. I also have what's called regeneration. And in regeneration, we've got the piece of the parent is detached, and it can grow and develop into an, a new individual. So the parent didn't break into pieces like it did with the fragmentation. Okay? Just a piece of it has been broken off, and it can, it's been detached, and it can grow and develop into an entirely new individual. Okay, so your fragmentation and your regeneration are going to be different. Organisms that can do fragmentations would be things like planarians, the flatworms that you see there in the picture, where, again, the entire organism breaks into distinct pieces, and every single little piece becomes a brand-new organism. And the last one that's listed here is uh, partho uh, parthenogenesis. And with parthenogenesis, basically an egg is laid that doesn't have to be fertilized. Okay? And so you can see here with this uh, whiptail lizard. That's the one in the middle. And so this female whiptail lizard here will lay an unfertilized egg and it will actually develop into um, offspring. So those are all examples of different kinds of asexual reproduction. So then let's talk about sexual reproduction for a minute. Sexual reproduction has its own set of advantages. Remember, asexual reproduction, it was uh, faster, it consumed less resources, you don't need a mate. Sexual reproduction, one of the major advantages of that is it gives variation within the species. Okay? It leads to genetic variation. 
And without variation in the species, you know, it really decreases your chance of survival. So um, sexual reproduction increases variation in the species. It does that through the processes of crossing over, and we'll talk about crossing over in a little bit. Okay. Um, the random chromosome arrangement, which we will also talk about in a little bit when we get to uh, metaphase of, um, of meiosis. It also, um, it's not technically the sex, well, the random fertilization, so it's not part of meiosis, but it's still part of sexual reproduction. So any sperm can fertilize any egg. Okay, so random fertilization leads to the variation. And then you also have behavior. Okay, the choice of mate in sexual reproduction has an, um, has an impact on the variation within the species. Um, sexual reproduction responds better to an environment that's changing because, again, there's more variation within the population. So there's a better um, response to a changing environment or an unstable environment. Okay. Uh, in sexual reproduction, you're going to have two two haploid cells um, will fuse to become one diploid cell. I am making a mess of this today, sorry. So two haploid cells, only one set of chromosomes, will fuse into one diploid cell, which will have then two sets of chromosomes. Okay, and it uses uh, meiosis, whereas asexual reproduction would either use binary fission for prokaryotes or mitosis for eukaryotes. Uh, sexual reproduction is going to use meiosis. So as we mentioned, sexual reproduction leads to diploid cells. So let's take a look at the advantages of having diploid cells uh, versus having um, haploid cells. So one of the advantages of having diploid cells is that there are two sets of the genes. So genes that are bad, they're harmful, okay, these genes can be masked, especially if they're recessive. So they don't necessarily have to be expressed and they don't, won't necessarily cause harm to the organism that has them. Okay, some of the disadvantages of uh, having a diploid uh, life cycle, so a diploid cell, which again has two sets of chromosomes in it, then is that you're going to have more chromosomes, and that actually can be a disadvantage. So it's an advantage in the sense that it can hide some that may be damaging, but it's a disadvantage in the fact that um, there's more chance, there's a bigger chance for something to go wrong, and more likely to go wrong during uh, division and the uh, separation of those chromosomes, uh, more chances to have mutations happen because there's just more of them in general. So in this diploid life cycle, you can see here you have the diploid organisms that went through meiosis and they produced haploid cells. Those two haploid cells come together to form another diploid cell, which then goes through mitosis and continues to grow and reproduce. Okay, um, as the organism grows. So looking at the haploid life cycle, okay, so you see in the haploid life cycle here, the mature organisms only have one set of chromosomes. Okay, and so to produce, <coughs> to produce gametes that will then fertilize, they actually go through mitosis. So they go through mitosis to um, produce their gametes, and those cell, uh, cells will come together to form one diploid cell. That one diploid cell will then go through meiosis and it will make develop into these spores that will mature into um, the what we know as the full-grown fungus or the adult mature fungal organism. So some disadvantages here would be that every gene is expressed. You can't hide anything with this. Okay? You only have one set of genes, one set of um, chromosomes, so every single thing is going to be expressed. Okay, so there's no masking anything here. An advantage, though, is that it does make it easier to reproduce because there are fewer chromosomes. Okay, fewer chromosomes to distribute, so it makes reproduction significantly easier.
And then you may remember this a little bit from plants, okay, this alternation of generation. So they um, bounce back and forth, basically, between um, the gametophyte generation and the sporophyte generation, the haploid and the diploid generation. So many of your mature uh, plants, they're going to be in that sporophyte generation, which is going to be that diploid generation. You can see uh, down here in this table okay, where your dominant things here, these are the sporophytes. Okay, the flowers, the trees, the ferns, okay, and then that gametophyte generation would be the spores, the pollens, the male and the female gametophyte. So the sporophyte generation goes through meiosis to produce those haploid cells. Those haploid cells okay, will actually go through mitosis to form <laughs> sperm and egg cells, which will then fertilize and continue to go through mitosis so that they can grow and develop. Let's take a second and do some human review. Okay, so remember humans have uh, 46 chromosomes. Remember they're arranged in pairs. So you have 22 pairs, or 44 in total, of autosomes. And basically those are anything that are not sperm and egg cell. Uh, they don't code for gender, pretty much. They're not what's called sex chromosomes. And then one pair of the sex chromosomes, which code for gender, not sperm and egg cells. I don't know what I was saying there. Okay, so 46 chromosomes, 22 pairs are autosomes that code for pretty much anything and everything in your body, and then one pair that will code for gender. They are the sex chromosomes. And remember, human, the homo chromosomes are paired up into homologous pairs. Okay, so your homologous chromosomes, those are chromosomes that will contain the same, um, they contain the same uh, genes, they carry the same genes that control the same characteristics, but they may have different alleles. Remember, you may have a chromosome that um, is, they're homologous and they code for eye color, but one has the allele for brown and one has the allele for blue. Okay, they are the same length. Remember, when you form this picture of the chromosomes or the karyotype here, that the chromosomes are paired up with their homologous partner, which is going to be the same length, and they're going to be arranged from um, longest to shortest, with the exception of the sex chromosomes. The sex chromosomes are always going to be the very last pair. You can see them. You cannot see it if I circle it in black. Okay, they're going to be the very last pair there, pair number 23. Okay, uh, they may not always be matched, actually. Remember, uh, boys, girls have two X chromosomes, so then they would match. But boys are X and a Y, so then they don't even, uh, they don't necessarily uh, match together like the autosomes do. And the picture can help you determine if there's a genetic abnormality, um, if there's something that has happened to the chromosomes. So let's do a um, quick kind of meiosis uh, intro. So how we're going to actually form these gametes for sexual reproduction. Okay, so meiosis goes from one diploid cell to four haploid cells. Okay, so so far we already have a big difference from mitosis. Remember, mitosis went from one diploid cell to two diploid cells. Now we're going to four cells. These cells are haploid. Okay, and they are going to be genetically different. Okay, they're going to be genetically different from both the parent as well as their sister cells. And you can see that uh, in the picture there. Obviously, they have to be genetically different if they don't have the same number of chromosomes. Right? And you can see um, that the chromosomes as well, well, this picture doesn't show up very well, but when we talk about crossing over, you'll see that, that the chromosomes themselves are not exactly the same. That's part of why siblings are not um, identical twins. So meiosis is um, broken into two parts. Okay? So there is a meiosis 1 here. And then there is a meiosis 2. So meiosis actually has two cell divisions, where mitosis only had one. And the purpose of meiosis here really is to create genetic variation. Okay, so it's for sexual reproduction. So we're trying to uh, create genetic variation. That is just terrible, terrible, terrible. Let's try that again. Okay, so we're trying to create genetic 
variation as well as to cut the chromosome numbers in half. So we create that genetic variation, we cut the chromosome number in half, we end up with those haploid cells. And we do this with the two divisions. So meiosis 1 is the part where we get most of that genetic variation and we cut the chromosome number in half. Okay, we go from um, the double-stranded replicated chromosomes back to the normal 46. Okay, so that's what we see happening here in meiosis 1. We're creating the genetic variation. A crossing over will happen there. Um, we, get, we cut the chromosome number in half in the sense that these are already replicated chromosomes. So in humans, there'd be um, 92 of them. And so we're going to cut them back down to the regular 46. Okay. Um, they're going to have genetically different haploid cells. And you're going to see all this in a little bit. Okay. Um, and then we're going to end up with one set of chromosome instead of two. So they actually are haploid cells. They're just replicated haploids because those um, chromatids have not been separated yet. I know this sounds incredibly confusing right now. Um, I think it'll make a lot more sense as we go through it bit by bit. And then meiosis two is going to separate the chromatids. So let's just, let's see what's happening here. Okay, so let's focus first on meiosis one. And that's what's happening here. This is the first cell division. So we're going through meiosis one. So let's look at what we've got set up here already. So what we have set up here already is DNA that has been replicated. So this cell has been through um, the S phase of um, the S phase of interphase. Prior to int prior to that, this cell would have looked like okay. it would have looked like that, right? That would have been our regular um, diploid cell. That was doing whatever body cell it was, okay? And so it was non-replicated, okay? The hom homologous pairs were paired together, okay? When the cell then went through the S phase, it ends up looking like this, right? And remember from before, that's a chromosome, 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 chromosome. Replicated, still chromosome, 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 chromosome. It doesn't matter if it's been replicated or not. And I know that makes that very confusing. Okay, so in meiosis one, we take these replicated chromosomes and we separate the pairs. Okay, we separate out these homologous pairs. Okay, so if you look at this non-replicated version, we're separating out the homologous pairs. So there's a, a long one that went into that cell and a long one that went into this cell. And then there is a short one that went into this cell and a short one into this cell. So we have separated the homologous pairs. Now we still haven't separated the replicated DNA yet, but we, like I said, we have separated the homologous pairs here, which is why technically the cell is now going to be haploid because we are, I'm gonna separate these replicated portions in just a minute. Each part of meiosis, meiosis one and meiosis two, goes through PMAT, just like mitosis. So you do not need to memorize every single detail about these. We're just gonna hit the high points of what's happening here during each one of these. And of course, the biggest one is gonna be first. It's gonna be prophase one, because this is where you're gonna get a lot of that genetic variation that's gonna happen. So let's look at, um, we're gonna stay just in meiosis one here. So again, we're cutting those homologous pairs apart. Okay, so let's look at what happens during prophase one of this. So in, we're in prophase one now of meiosis one. And what we're going to focus on for what's happening here is um, we care the most about what's called the crossing over. And if you remember um, from your freshman year, slightly earlier in the video, crossing over is where we get genetic variation. This is really important for getting um, making these haploid cells different from one another. So for crossing over to occur, the first thing that we need is the homologous pairs will come together. They will synapse and align and basically stick together into what is called a tetrad. So that's what this is here. 
Okay, I've got my blue chromosome is one homologous pair. Remember, they were replicated. And then my red chromosome is the other homologous, is its homologous partner. And so the two of them will come together. They will line up, okay, and proteins will basically hook them together. Okay, so proteins will hook those um, together, hook those homologous chromosomes together. And then at certain places along the length of the chromosomes, you will have this crossing over occur. And those places are called the chiasma. Okay, and you can see one here okay, that results in the crossing over. You can see one here. So the chiasma is where the crossing over has taken place. And what will happen is as these homologous chromosomes, they're fused together now, they will splice portions of each one and switch places. So they're uh, just exchanging the exact same information. Let's say these chromosomes that you're looking here had genes for uh, hair color. Okay. And this is extremely oversimplified. There are genes for hair color um, on the top, eye color here. So we've got hair color, eye color, and this whole bottom portion here is skin color. So everything about color here. So we could take okay, just this portion right here for eye color, because it codes for the same thing, and switch it out red for blue. So now I'm going to end up with a chromosome that is red. blue, and then red, and then the other side, it's replicated, portion is still red and red, and then its homologous chromosome is blue, red, blue, blue, blue. Okay, so now these chromosomes, remember this is a homologous pair here. So this is a homologous pair. In meiosis one, I'm separating out these pairs, right? I'm getting those pairs into their individual cells. In meiosis, meiosis two, I'm going to separate out these chromatids. So now I get these individual chromosomes. And if you notice, each chromosome now is different, right? I've got some that are mostly red with a little bit of blue, some that are totally red, some that are mostly blue with a little bit of red, and some that are totally blue. Okay, but it allows for variation. And so the places along the chromosomes where that crossing over has occurred is called the chiasma. The tetrad is the two pairs fusing together. The chiasma is the portion that actually switches, and the whole process is crossing over. After prophase one, I have to have a metaphase one. Same as in mitosis, they're lining up along the metaphase plate. Okay, their random assortment here is another way that we get genetic variation. Okay, how they're going to line up on that plate to be separated. Remember, I'm separating the homologous pairs here. Okay, so, for instance, you'll see on this one, I've got red on this side, blue on the other side. Down here, I've got one homologous, um, one set of the blue chromosomes on one side, a set of the red chromosomes on the other side. Okay, that random assortment, again, leads to more genetic variation. It'll give me a mix of red and blue chromosomes in each of the um, daughter cells. After metaphase one, I need an anaphase one. So again, my homologous chromosomes are what are separating here. The centromeres are not broken. And so the sister chromosomes, the sister chromatids, are still attached because the centromeres are not split apart here. And this is where we can have some possible mutations happening, in particular what's called a non-disjunction. So you've seen a non-disjunction before, okay? There were two, basically, again, like I said, this is when the chromosomes fail to separate properly. And so there are two, uh, two basic kinds of, or two major examples of non-disjunction. So either the tetrad chromosomes don't separate properly or the sister chromatids aren't separating properly. Um, but you can end up with either a diploid plus one, which would be a trisomy, an example of that would be uh, Down syndrome. So in this case, you've got an extra copy of a chromosome somewhere. You can see that happening here. Okay. Um, another would be a diploid plus one, which would be the monosomy. An example of that would be Turner syndrome. 
Turner syndrome happens in uh, females. So instead of having two X chromosomes, they only have one X chromosome. Uh, this can also be called an aneuploidy. We talked about this a little bit with uh, uh, some plants and stuff. Okay, so now you've got a fertilized zygote, possibly. If that gamete survives and that gamete is fertilized, you end up with this aneuploidy. So you've got a fertilized zygote that doesn't have the proper number of chromosomes. And a lot of, a lot of time that can be fatal. Plants can handle that usually better than animals, but uh, for many animals, this will end up being fatal. So if any of these gametes got fertilized, you would end up with the aneuploidy and this fertilized zygote with the wrong number of chromosomes. So after anaphase one, then we're gonna have a telophase one. And during telophase one uh, is where you're gonna have cytokinesis occurring as well. So we're splitting into two haploid cells now that have double-stranded chromosomes. So we've separated out those homologous pairs. So they only have one pair of each chromosome. But remember, the, those chromosomes were replicated a long time ago in interphase. So now we need to separate out those sister chromatids, which is what's gonna happen during meiosis two. So during meiosis 2, just like in, um, in meiosis 1, we're going to have a PMAT situation, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And what I'm doing here is I'm going to take these chromosomes, these sister chromatids, and we're going to split them apart. So now I end up with these four haploid cells. Okay, so the DNA had already been replicated, and we're going to separate out those double-stranded chromosomes. Meiosis 2 is going to be very similar to mitosis. So in um, prophase 1, of meiosis two, so I've got, I'm sorry, prophase two, okay, I am, same thing is happening as it what did in mitosis. Again, we're getting rid of the nucleus, um, we're forming the spindle fibers. Again, you don't have to memorize all these details. And again, prophase two is gonna be followed by a metaphase two, where again, metaphase, they always, they're lining up in the middle along that metaphase plate, getting ready to be separated. Conidochore, um, the proteins are attaching to the conidochores to be able to pull these sister chromatids apart. So in anaphase two, um, this is where these sister chromatids are actually going to separate. The centromeres will break apart. And so that separates out those sister chromatids, those replicated pieces of DNA. So those centromeres will separate, cytokinesis may start here, and these sister chromatids are gonna to move towards the opposite end of the poles. And then finally, after anaphase two, we're gonna have telophase two and the finishing out of cytokinesis. Again, very similar to mitosis. Reform that nucleus, the chromosomes will unwind back into chromatin, break down those spindle fibers, hey, and you will end up with these four new daughter cells that are gonna be haploid and are going to be um, genetically different from the parent as well as each other. Just one more thing to kind of sum up your <clears throat> differences between meiosis one and meiosis two. Okay, so again, uh, during meiosis one, we're separating these homologous pairs. Okay, so you can see here's your homologous pairs and we're gonna pull those apart. We still have those replicated chromosomes. So we end up with haploid cells now. And then in meiosis two, <laughs> we're gonna <clears throat> break those centromeres and you're gonna end up separating out those sister chromatids so that you only have one copy of each homologous pair. A quick application to humans. Okay, um, <clears throat> it's in humans. Well, in any organism, when we're forming the gametes, it's called gametogenesis. In Genesis, we make something new, just like in the, um, for those of you that are religious, just like in the Bible, gen is to generate. Okay, so gametogenesis in humans. Uh, we have spermatogenesis in males. Spermatogenesis um, produces four viable sperm cells. So all four of those sperm cells are viable and could go fertilize an egg. Okay. In females, it's oogenesis. Oogenesis produces only one viable ovum or egg that is able to be fertilized. And that's, um, there, and that's due to, as you notice, these polar bodies here, they're significantly smaller. And those polar bodies are so much smaller because there's an unequal division of the cytoplasm. And if you think about it, the sperm cell is the one that has to travel. It's got to travel to the egg and it's got to be able to fertilize the egg. And so the sperm cell, because it has to travel, it cannot, re it can't carry the nutrients to sit to sustain the zygote. So because the egg stays in one place, the egg contains most of the organelles, it contains the cytoplasm, the nutrients, to be able to sustain that zygote. So it has an uneven division um, as it's going through meiosis so that it produces the significantly larger gamete that's gonna be able to be supported. 
Okay, so we're obviously going to be doing some comparisons and contrasting between mitosis and meiosis, but just so we don't lose sight of the big idea real quick, remember mitosis produces two genetically identical daughter cells. They're genetically identical to the parent, okay, they're the same as the parent, the same as one another, diploid to diploid, same chromosomes. Um, meiosis gets that genetic variation in there, so it goes through two divisions. It produces four individual genetically different gametes. They are different from each other as well as different from the parent cell okay, because they have things like crossing over and random assortment. Okay. So we'll be doing a lot of comparing and contrasting between these two things coming up in class.